Hello everyone. In today's webinar, I will be talking about electromagnetic simulation, primarily 3D for electronic devices. So let me give a brief overview on what we have on our agenda today. I will give first an update on uh, Siemens Digital Industry software, specifically then the Accelerator portfolio and the SimCenter portfolio. Then I will discuss some challenges specifically for electronics and how these are linked to electromagnetic simulation. I will also give an overview on our solutions for electromagnetics in SimCenter uh, portfolio and then go through some examples, a PCB power supply, antenna, propagation modeling, and EMC EMI. So start by giving an introduction into where we are with Siemens Digital Industries uh, software. So Accelerator is today our comprehensive integrated portfolio of software, services, and an application development platform. So the portfolio Accelerator will accelerate the transformation of businesses into truly digital enterprises and also unlocks a powerful industrial network effect. Basically essential requirements, I would say, to leverage the complexity that you are all facing as a real competitive advantage, no matter the industry or company you are in. So tomorrow, industry will be shaped by a network of digital enterprises, we believe. These digital enterprises will share data and collaborate in the design, the manufacturing, the deployment of product, as well as the processes. Three critical business imperatives have emerged that will drive operational excellence and digital transformation. First of all, a comprehensive digital twin is at the center of digital transformation. Secondly, Companies must take a personalized approach. There are many ways to digital transformation. A single approach would, will basically not work for everyone. So companies need to be able to work at their own pace and at their own choice. So it's a personalized, adaptable um, approach. And finally, no organization exists in isolation. Digitalization extends throughout the industrial ecosystem and collaboration between organizations is necessary to create the value. So companies must create this industrial network effect. Suppliers, customers, partners, distributors, for example, all are collaborating within the ecosystem of engineering excellence and hence a flexible open ecosystem being one of the cornerstones of the accelerator uh, platform. So the comprehensive digital twin is essentially a key enabler for this transformation. It must be comprehensive in that it covers the entire product and production life cycle, and it must include also a closed loop to ensure actual operational performance of a system. The data is fed back into models that are continuously refined. It also needs to scale to cover everything from let's say materials to components, to systems, to systems of systems, and the entire products, including the electronics, the mechanical design, the software, manufacturing, app development, and IoT analytics. And that's a very core part of what we do. Within the Accelerator portfolio, we have a set of solutions under the SimCenter portfolio brand name, which are essentially focusing on simulation and test the big focus on the comprehensive digital twin i would say it's really at the heart of the comprehensive digital twin in the sim center portfolio we are covering simulation and test in the area of mechanical simulation computational fluid dynamics electromagnetic and electronics physical testing system simulation with other tools like process data management workflow automation exploration and analytics uh, as well. So I belong to the electromagnetics part and the electronics is going to be the focus of this webinar. Now these solutions, this whole portfolio of Accelerator and SimCenter didn't come overnight. It is actually the result of a sizable 
investment by uh, Siemens into best-in-class technologies. Started around a bit less than 15 years ago with the acquisition of Unigraphics. And then also acquisitions, larger acquisitions like LMS, CD Adapco, Mentor Graphics, and many more, basically allowed us to build a portfolio of world-class, best-in-class uh, products and a, a, let's say, comprehensive digital twin portfolio. So let me now go into the, the scope of this webinar today and discuss a bit the challenges that we see in electronics. And the first image I'm putting here on, on the slide is a typical example of the trend from mechanical more into electronics. While a watch in the past was purely mechanical with mechanical forces and moving components, today, this industry is moving also into pure electronics. Yet, of course, a lot of the requirements are similar. I mean, it's all about reliability, robustness, comfort, cost have been also requirements in the mechanical age. But today we have additional requirements because we go essentially into, into this new era. Things like communication are new, clearly. Battery and charging, RF radiation, and so on, of course, are now also requirements. And some of these requirements we see in this electronic device, this watch, are dealing with electromagnetics. But electromagnetics is, is not the only, of course, physics we have to consider for developing such a watch. We also have mechanical aspect, for example, and here I'm showing just a few uh, movies. On the left, you see the drop test of an electronic device. That's also an application we support in our uh, in our portfolio. It's a very key requirement for, let's say, consumer type electronic devices. Looking at forces, looking at um, at areas where it can potentially uh, break. Or also an aspect is the let's say on the uh, in the electronic space is the cooling and the thermal aspect of electronic devices, because thermal loading is one of the the uh, critical aspects of the proper functioning of an electronic device. So while as we also support these multiple discipline and multiple physics, it's not going to be the focus in this uh, presentation, but still I wanted to give you an idea of our multidiscipline uh, aspect. So where does, in this case, electromagnetic simulation fits into this electronic uh, device? Well, it goes in several ways. We have communication. Let me put in my pointer here. So we have the communication aspect. In this device, there are antennas and they need to be integrated. There is communication on the propagation side of things. There is reliability. Not, of course, mechanical, but also electronic. For example, signal and power integrity of the electronic systems. Reliability can also deal with ESD electric um, uh, discharge uh, problem, RF standards, including hazards, because if, this, if these electronic devices are including RF components, there might be some regulations normative to take these into account. Also sound, where does that come from? Well, actually, the uh, activator that is giving the sound from such a device is electronically driven. So there might be an aspect of sound uh, as well. Very important is charging. So it's not only about the, let's say, the the, uh, the life of a battery, but also how fast you can charge, of course, this uh, component. Also, reliability can be dealing with EMC, EMI. Of course, you want to make sure that this watch is still functioning if you, for example, put it close to an uh, RF uh, source, so to speak. So it's all aspects that basically uh, call for the use of electromagnetic simulation to essentially allow you to comply to the uh, to, to the requirements. So let's now go to the uh, look at what the solutions in Sim Center are for electromagnetics with a focus on electronics. And here is essentially a overview of our um, a segmentation, so to speak, of our solutions. 
it's not only sim center you also see the accelerator portfolio and i'll explain you uh, why that is so on the left side we have solutions for low frequency em low frequency electromagnetics we have a range of solutions for high frequency electromagnetics in the accelerator portfolio from the siemens eda side we have also specific solutions for electromagnetic simulation at the level of IC package and PCB. More in particular, for example, the Hyperlinks product linked to Expedition is really doing signal and power integrity on PCBs. Now, this aspect will not be addressed here. Hyperlinks is a world leading product for studying signal power integrity on, uh, on electronic systems. And, uh, and that's basically also one of the world leading uh, product. And then the fourth category is specialty high end. It's for example, where you have a coupling between thermal flow, electromagnetic, structural, all combined, so to speak, in a very sophisticated multi-physics model. This can happen also in electronic devices. For example, if you need to model plasma, Plasma is such a, a phenomenon where basically you need to really do very detailed, highly integrated multi-physics coupled analysis. We have that capability as well through in our SimCenter uh, platform. So let's now focus on the two left, uh, two left categories here. What is what does it mean low frequency electromagnetics? It's basically a category of applications that are, so to speak, identified, characterized by primarily energy conversion. It leans a lot to electrical, electromechanical, and it converts energy from mechanical to electrical, for example, from for a generator or from electrical to mechanical, a motor or an actuator, or from electrical to thermal, for example, for induction heating and so on. So it's primarily about energy conversion. I would say 95% of the applications are dealing with that category. A technical note, if you if you wish, in these particular applications, there is no really an electromagnetic propagating wave. It's not about the speed of light with a wave propagating, coupling electric mechanic, uh, magnetic fields. So it, that's not really it. It's really uh, low frequency, no really wave effects are taken into account here. And typically technology, that is most relevant for addressing such applications are finite element based. That's at least to our uh, strong belief and clearly excelling in nonlinear finite element technology. Nonlinear because you have a number of nonlinear effects being it, let's say, displacement related, but also being it material related, saturation of material clearly generate some nonlinear effects, which is which is very key. So that's low frequency, and we have that solution fully supported in our SIM center uh, solutions. On the aspect of high frequency, what does that mean? Again, it's also a collection of applications that primarily, let's say 95%, are linked to low energy. It's for communication. It leans much more into electronic space. I say 95% because there is still some percentage where, for example, for RF heating, where you could, for example, use RF technology to heat components, in which case, of course, it's also about uh, electric uh, or, let's say, energy conversion. But primarily, it's really about communication electronics. On a technical note, in these applications, they are typically can involve or are involving electromagnetic waves that are traveling at the speed of light. And also, these problems are primarily linear uh, problems that are solved preferably by a linear solver technology. The electromagnetic spectrum is a very wide spectrum, a very large uh, range, dynamic range. The applications we are focusing on today are primarily in the radio waves, microwave area. This is where a lot of the, let's say, the communication issues of, of, of problems or challenges are happening in electronic devices or also EMC compatibility interference studies are happening. Although you could also use that same technology for really going up into the infrared and higher frequencies, I would say 
today we focus more on these radio waves and microwaves for the applications we are uh, targeting. So these two techniques, both low frequency and high frequency, are fully integrated into the SimCenter 3D environment okay, and uh, are really world-class products. I mean, this is not coming up. Let's say the, the low frequency is actually based on the magnet solver technology from a company in Folitica. And this has been a global leader since about 40 years in, in electromagnetic simulation with extremely advanced, high fidelity, high speed solutions for addressing low frequency problems. And similarly, it goes into the high frequency uh, space. For those of you who are not familiar with SimCenter 3D, so SimCenter 3D is a multi-discipline integrated platform. It is built on NX, which is the uh, CAT uh, platform of uh, uh, Siemens Digital Industries uh, software. And essentially, it allows you as an engineer to really, let's say, import designs from any origin, create designs, modify designs, do geometric parametric uh, analysis, uh, so to speak, completely integrated. And we support multiple disciplines. Means that from one CAD design of a system, you can run different disciplines. You can do a drop test on your electronic device. You can do a vibration test. You can do a sound study. You can do an EMC analysis, a communication, and so on. And it's all integrated into this one, one platform. So here, just on SimCenter 3D for takeaways, as I just mentioned, it's an, it has an integrated design environment that you as an engineer can really benefit from, because now you can really parameterize your design in a very intuitive geometrical sense. It has outstanding electromagnetic capability, both on the low frequency and high frequency. So the upper picture there is a six degree of freedom uh, uh, robotic, uh, let's say, uh, um, arm or, or uh, uh, component, and it has all these components moving with respect to each other, which is a fairly complex thing to do in a general sense in, in, in low frequency EM uh, product. As I mentioned, it's multiple disciplines. You can do drop testing, you can look at mechanical stiffnesses, strength, and so on. And number four, it all fits into the accelerator platform, which is a higher level platform. It, it, it supports, let's say, the comprehensive digital twin uh, as well. So what are, I think what is very important as well to understand is what are now these technologies that we have integrated into, um, into our platform? What, what really solvers do we have? What technologies do we have? And I think you would uh, look at the middle side of this picture where it says uh, system. And system is where you describe mathematically your system for an electromagnetic analysis. You typically would do that in 3D by a discretization technique. And there is many types of discretization. There is a finite element, there is boundary element, there is FDTD, there is ray tracing, physical optics, and so on. In fact, the, uh, there is a very big application range in electromagnetics. There is also a very large dynamic range in terms of frequency. So essentially, it's, it's just impossible to have just one technology that covers all applications and all frequency ranges. So a, a good solution essentially should be that you have different technologies at hand, depending on your application and depending on your frequency of interest. The technology that we, for the high frequency side, that we are focusing on is based on boundary element, and it's a well-known method of moments, MOM, uh, which is a boundary element technique. It means that you only need to model the surface of your system. You do not need to model specifically, let's say, the air around it. You, you just model uh, the surface, and that all results in surface-based discretization. And by not having the need to model the, uh, the air itself, not the volume, so to speak, it of course reduces very drastically the number of elements you have because it's really a surface approach. And also it links very well to the design because as a designer designing a certain system, uh, let's say an encapsulation or an, um, 
or, or a certain, let's say, me mechanical component. There is no need to basically model the air around it. You just take the surface of that design and that directly can represent your boundary element mesh, so to speak. That's a very, from efficiency viewpoint, a very important, important technology. Now, MM works very well if your system is, let's say, of small to medium size. But if you really go to very large systems, which can happen, of course, if you have bigger systems that are running up to much higher frequencies, then you're ending up into really huge uh, system matrices. And then we have acceleration techniques. The most well-known one is MLFMA, multi-level fast multipole, that really allows you to run very fast, big boundary element uh, solutions, MM solutions, using this fast multipole acceleration. Both MOM and MLFMA are full wave uh, approaches. So they really, let's say, um, they really model the system in, in very detail. And there is not really an uh, approximation that we uh, need to take into account here. We also have asymptotic techniques, UTD and IPO. IPO stands for Iterative Physical Optics. It's a physical optics uh, technique. And I would say in terms of accuracy speeds, it sits a little bit between a ray tracing and the full wave approach. Why would you need this? Well, because sometimes your system can become so large or your frequency is so high that the standard full wave is just not capable of solving it. To be very clear, for example, you cannot solve a complete, let's say an aircraft, full size aircraft up to several gigahertz for communication purposes. That's just not feasible with a full wave approach. So you need to apply asymptotic uh, techniques, which works much faster, but of course are a bit less accurate compared to the full wave. Then we have UTD, Unified Theory of Diffraction, which is a ray tracing based approach, which typically works in, in really bigger systems, like in this case, the picture you see there is a factory. You can look at, for example, at coverage inside a uh, factory. I would say these are our main uh, main solvers. Uh, we have also SPEAK for low frequency uh, as well. Typically, if you use these techniques down into the lower frequency part of the spectrum, uh, you need to have special techniques to solve that. We have that. And also there is particular solvers for dealing with uh, cables. Uh, that's really representing the system. And of course, somehow you need to excite the system. You do it by exciting ports, by putting voltages on ports, by uh, looking at dipoles, magnetic electric dipoles, synthetic antennas. Synthetic antennas means that you might, if you're buying an antenna from an antenna supplier, you can do a measurement on that antenna. From that, construct an equivalent antenna and use that equivalent antenna in your device to look at what is the interaction of that equivalent antenna with your device. So that's what we call a synthetic antenna. It's basically a reduced order model if you want. And what can you get out of these uh, calculations? Well, you can get many things out of that. I mean, you can, of course, in the case of antenna, you can get your SYZ parameters out of that. You can look at induced currents currents inside the system or inside the cables. You can look at directivity, the gains, and you can look at very particular applications like WERF, what happens in high intensity radiated fields, IEL, it's lightning, what happens when there is a lightning strike, hazards are, are a particular application because it's linked also to normatives, EMP, electromagnetic pulse, uh, time, uh, and so on. So there's a number of aspects you can do to analyze your results, either in a gener general way or in a very particular application way. Okay, so, so that basically is showing a bit the uh, portfolio of, uh, let's say, the different technologies into our uh, SimCenter 3D electromagnetics. Let's, let me walk you through a few examples now. And the first one here is a PCB power supply. And clearly it links to electronics because it's really a device that is loading the, the majority of the, or I would say all of the electronic uh, devices uh, today. Although of course, as an individual, if you buy that, it is a pretty 
cheap is not very expensive, uh, right? Um, but of course, if you look at the combination of all the, these devices in the world, we are talking about several hundreds of millions, billions of these devices around there. Uh, everybody has several of these uh, of these at home. And although it is a cheap device, there is quite some complexity and sophistication to the development of that device, because there are certain requirements that that there are that that customers have that that consumers have. It needs to be fast charging, obviously. Right? I mean, it's a big difference if you charge a mobile phone in five minutes versus one hour. It has to be convenient. Right? I mean, some people prefer wireless charging because of the convenience. In this case, this is wired charger here. It has to be highly efficient. Uh, although the energy loss is, of course, not that big, but you want it to be efficient. You do not want to, uh, let's say, have this thing heated up because of a low efficiency and a low... Uh, it has, of course, also uh, the cost factor is important. You really want to optimize material usage in order to keep the cost down. And the form factor is also very important. I'm sure many of you remember the early, uh, so to speak, transformers for these devices, which were clearly much bigger and much heavier and probably did not have uh, fast charging time and so on. So really, there is a big focus on these consumer uh, requirements. Uh, we have a customer, uh, world global leader into these devices, a company called uh, Cellcom. There is also a case study. You can you can obtain it from from Siemens. It's also here, shown in this PDF, uh, which basically explains in that company what their challenges are and how they are using a SimCenter 3D for basically uh, really using electromagnetic engineering for optimizing these uh, chargers. So what is it all about? Such a such as charger essentially will 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 take uh, basically an AC current from the net and will convert that into pulses of uh, basically DC, so to speak, uh, that, that basically is loading the uh, bat uh, basically is loading the battery of the mobile uh, phone or some other electronic uh, devices. Clearly these devices are very compact. Inside there is iron, there is copper, this copper is carrying uh, AC. This iron is carrying have also let's say hysteresis effect has eddy currents inside, and therefore it will also has, have some losses uh, with that. And of course, because it's a very small device, also, uh, let's say, operating at high operating frequencies, essentially the uh, losses can be significant and can really increase, let's say, the temperature of these, uh, uh, of these devices. When I talk about higher operating frequencies, I'm talking about several tens of kilohertz because there is switching in, into this uh, into this device uh, clearly. So uh, this device takes, for example, a DC and it switches it uh, uh, with, for example, a switching frequency of 100 kilohertz or, or 75 kilohertz or whatever. And of course, uh, to be more, uh, of course, clearly uh, uh, efficient. And at these uh, high operating frequencies, compact devices, you really can have uh, losses and can have increased of uh, temperature. Now, in order to assess all of that, in order to assess really if material is used most efficiently, right? If you if you design the material, you want to make sure that clearly the, let's say the iron material is used in a way that is effective. Huh? You really need to do very detailed electromagnetic field analysis. You really need to go into the details of such a field to make sure that yes, my uh, my material is used in an optimal optimal way. Also to predict with high accuracy inductances versus frequency, which is uh, which is also a key component. You also need to do highly accurate 3D analysis. Now, if you're talking about highly accurate 3D analysis, it's not just only about building a detailed finite element model and solving a big finite element model. It's also making sure that you capture, I mean, as accurate as possible, the physics into your numerical model. And an important aspect in, in this particular application is how to model iron losses. Iron losses means hysteresis and eddy current losses into your uh, core material. There is different ways of doing that. One way is that you do not take into account 
into the solution itself, but you only take these losses into account in the post-processing phase. So essentially you calculate your EM field without any notion, so to speak, of losses. And then in a post-analysis, you try to understand the losses from the, from the initial uh, EM field analysis. That is an approach that is widely used, but I would say it's not sufficient to really have your accurate prediction of the EM field. In order to have an accurate prediction of the EM field, you really want to get your, let's say, your iron losses taken into account during the solution, during the energy balance solving itself, not in the post analysis, but really during the solution. And by doing that, you will have a much higher accurate prediction of the iron losses, hysteresis, eddy current losses, and so on. And this is exactly what, what we do here in our solution. We really do take nonlinear material properties and we take that into account during the solution phase to come up with extremely accurate predictions of the fields and therefore of the losses and, uh, and so on. We have done this analysis in this case. It, it, it's also explained in the, uh, in, in the reference case. Uh, in this case, we have the geometry was imported from Altium. I want to be clear here, of course, we do have our own uh, electronic design uh, uh, software as well, like, like an expedition, uh, but we are also open to any other uh, software on the market so we can import from different, uh, different vendors. So we take that model into our SimCenter 3D environment. That's a geometrical model. And typically when you do that, there is a need to let's say the feature that uh, that geometry because what's coming in is not necessarily exactly in the same in, in the right form to directly be used in a simulation context so typically you will need to do some some pre uh, some pre-processing luckily the sim center 3d environment is based on um, on the uh, nx foundation and therefore there is a plenty of tools to essentially very efficiently allow you to set up that geometry to be used then in uh, for electromagnetic simulation so that's basically geometric and then of course you're setting up your uh, your analysis in this case uh, i believe for this case we got a, uh, a dc input into the device here 120 volt uh, we do it at 35 percent duty cycle we took a switching frequency at 75 kilohertz that's not of course something that is fixed i mean that that's for example, could also be a design optimization. You can check, for example, what happens if I'm going into higher voltage with a lower duty cycle, a higher switching frequency, lower switching frequency. So all of these parameters you can play with to ultimately get you the most optimal, uh, optimal design. So what we're getting out of this analysis are typically flux density distribution, current distribution. Current distribution is very important because if you're putting copper traces on your PCB or if you have a certain copper layers. And if you notice, of course, that the current is only flowing at the edges, that the center is not really carrying a lot of current, which can happen into these high frequencies, that of course would not be very ideal because then you're losing a lot of copper that is not very effective. So this copper distribution is, is in clearly an important aspect. And of course, with that also copper losses clearly because it, that goes somewhere uh, together. Also current waveforms, because that's what you want to check, how much of that current essentially is going into my, uh, into my electronic uh, device. From the geometry that you imported and that you processed, you need to create a mesh. We have a whole range, a very wide range of meshing capability in SimCenter 3D, where we can set mesh controls to really create that optimal mesh for that particular application. The mesh of uh, the core, the primary windings, the secretary windings here, you see it's pretty fine. So this is really a several, I'm not sure exactly how much, but I think a 10 million or something um, uh, element, uh, element model. So it really is very fine. And you need to create that fine mesh because also as of the skin effects that, that can happen, that, that basically call for a very fine uh, mesh in these, uh, in these systems. Um, this is a low frequency problem, although it's talk about kilohertz, it is a low frequency because the application here is energy conversion and there are nonlinear effects. 
there are nonlinear effects because of the material. So, okay, we have on the one hand copper with a certain conductivity, but we also have core material, which has a nonlinear BH curve. And this nonlinear BH curve is, and you see it on a picture of, of one of the dialogues, is highly nonlinear. And there is a nonlinear relation between B and H, but also temperature dependent. You see here, this you can give in the temperature and you can construct different uh, temperature curves for your BH curve. But also frequency you can give. You see here, we have here iron loss at 20 Celsius, 20 degrees Celsius for different frequency ranges, because in your optimization, you might opt for looking at, let's say an optimization for different uh, switching frequencies. So therefore, that frequency dependency upon the pH curve is actually a key, a key aspect as well. And we can do that. So that's really very highly nonlinear, multidimensional pH curves we can easily enter and deal with in the uh, software. Uh, clearly, such a model, I mean, there is, a, let's say, a circuit to that. You need to excite it. There is a loading to that. So that somewhere also need to be taken into account. And we do this typically by, an, uh, by a circuit. So the lower part here is the circuit of that system. So on the left side, that's the primary side. On the right side, the secondary model. So basically, on the left side, you have, let's say, a high, higher voltage on the order of 120 uh, volt and uh, small current. And on the right side, clearly, you have lower voltage and higher current that goes into your uh, device. And that current that goes into the device, these pulses of current, you need to basically check uh, what, they, uh, what, what they are. So you build basically this uh, circuit and that circuit capability we have integrated into, uh, into SimCenter 3D. So you can take in voltage sources, switches, capacitors, diodes, and so on. And here you see as one here is this switching. That's a 75 uh, kilohertz switching that you apply here for that switching uh, frequency. So that's a setup. And of course, then you have your results. When you have set that up, you can calculate your, uh, your uh, analysis. So you can look at, as I mentioned, you can look at flux inside the uh, core material. It's important to do that because you want to check how effective that material is. And if it's not effective, of course, there is no need to use that, uh, that, that amount of material because you want to minimize the weight, the size, the amount of material for reducing costs. So you, typically, you want to do that analysis. Also at the copper side, you see the different uh, coils of the uh, copper, the primary and the secondary. You really want to check the current distribution because if it's not, let's say, if it's not uh, equally distributed, you might want to change, for example, uh, the, uh, let's say, the coil geometry or the size to make it more equally and to make sure that all the copper is uh, as much as possible behaving uh, in a similar way. And then you have your currents on the right side here, uh, primary and secondary, and that basically here on the lower side is the current. And I think you, it's a little bit slow in, in the, uh, the dimension, but you see it almost up to 10 amps here, going that uh, current and that goes into the, uh, into the device. So these are typically the analysis that you look for and with which you can then optimize your uh, system. You can also look at really losses and so on and temperature effects as well. So this is just to conclude the summary. First example, electronic device for charging. We have that complete process enabled in, uh, in our SimCenter environment. We are running the SimCenter magnet solver and do the pre-processing, we are running the solver. And to give you an idea, as I mentioned, we are talking about, it's actually over 10 million, it's 17 million elements, that elements with 7 million DOFs. Uh, also, although a very small device, it, it really is, there is some sophistication to that because of the, uh, let's say, the high frequency and these scan effects in there that you need to take into account. Um, and today we are solving that with 60 time steps here, which is basically one cycle of that switching uh, behavior uh, with six solving threads here, three gigabyte memory and around uh, six hours. This was in our previous solver. We do have, in the meantime, also some uh, more uh, HPC solving capability that reduces that, uh, that time. So this was the uh, first example. The uh, second example here is more dealing with an example I was actually showing already in the beginning of the, uh, of the webinar. This is about um, a uh, sport watch, so to speak. 
which today really have communication requirements. Obviously, in a mechanical watch, this was not the case, but in such a new uh, electronic watch, this is the case. There is clearly a GPS system. You want to know where you are. There is a Bluetooth, or there is Wi-Fi, or there is 4G, or in the future, there's going to be 5G. And probably these, actually, these uh, antennas uh, will might need to work together or have to be present at the same time into these uh, devices. Now, not all manufacturers have all of these uh, antenna capability. Some of them have, some of them only have a subset. Now, in any case, there are, let's say, antennas and RF systems inside uh, inside this device. So somewhere you need to design an antenna system that basically fits into this uh, device with a certain performance. Performance in terms of clearly requirement for S parameters, the frequency band that it needs to work in, the directivity, the gain, and so on. And if you look at the antenna geometries, I would say that yeah, on the one hand, there is, of course, a big range of patch antennas printed on PCBs, as you can see here. I downloaded it from the internet. It's probably not going to be used in a watch, but okay, this is a sort of an antenna geometry what is typically uh, used a lot. But not everything is like a patch antenna. There is also just 3D geometrical shapes where every aspect of the shape, the length, the thickness, and so on, is going to be important for the fundamental, uh, let's say, uh, performances of the antenna. And if you want, this particular shape actually is, uh, is is coming from this watch. So the sport watch that you see in the previous screen actually integrates this particular antenna. So antenna is not about a patch. In this case, it's really about a 3D structure that um, that gives a certain performance of the antenna. Antennas can also have other shapes, like on the lower left side, you see in a uh, general 3D shape or very even additive manufacturing these days is used to develop 3D shapes of antennas. So it's really very uh, 3D oriented. So that's one aspect. So uh, clearly, if you want to take into account model the performance of that communication system in it using these type of antennas, which are 3D, clearly it's 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 very important to have it integrated into an environment that can easily handle 3D geometries. And SimCenter 3D is based on an X, so that's basically in our genes. That, that, that's what we do essentially. So that's a very good match. But it's not only at the, let's say, the smaller scale of that uh, antenna that is, uh, that is going to be, uh, that needs to be looked at, right? You also need to integrate this antenna into the device, which is the second picture, because there is going to be interaction of that small antenna with the device itself. That interaction can reflect in changes of S parameters, right? Also frequency changes, but also in terms of gains and, uh, and directivities clearly. So you can, for example, look at what is the effect of putting here a ring into this uh, watch and how does it distort, so to speak, the antenna pattern. But also interaction with the human. Uh, there was a small movie, it's not working here, but Anyway, so I'll, uh, oops, yeah, here it is. Uh, so basically, if you put that antenna on, on an arm, it will also basically uh, interfere or let's say uh, interact with that, uh, with that uh, arm. And of course, on a higher scale, you have then also the environment itself because you're walking in a room, for example, and you want to have a communication. So it's all these different scales that we have, uh, that we have our solution. Now, I was mentioning that uh, there is also antennas printed on PCB. And with the slide, I want to mention also that we have into the, the, DIS, uh, the DISW portfolio, X accelerator portfolio, a product called Expedition. That we have uh, Expedition and a product called PCB Exchange. And this allows you essentially PCB Exchange to take a model from Expedition the board itself, including that, uh, let's say the RF structure here, this antenna, get it through PCB exchange automatically into SimCenter 3D and do an antenna directivity or S parameter study with that. That capability we have, I wanna mention that if you are an expedition user or you want to model uh, such an antenna. Antenna of course is not only at the level of the PCBs as I mentioned, but it also needs to be considered at the integration level. 
And what we have here is look at the performance of an antenna communication device sitting on a drone. You see here the measure is pretty fine because clearly your discretization should be such that uh, you need a certain number of elements per wavelength. So we have different antennas here, two communication antennas, one GPS antenna. We can define these into our navigator and you see what now is the dialogue for our solution. You can select a certain solver. You have to select a certain source, the communication or the GPS antennas. Uh, you can apply that uh, over there. You can also bring in your own beyond the standard forms, you can bring in your own antenna directivity or equivalent antenna. Like in this case, this GPS is basically imported from, uh, from an external classification. So we measure basically that antenna in unequal conditions and we integrate that into the drone as an equivalent, uh, equivalent system. Once we have done that, we can, uh, we can first solve the basic equations MON and then afterwards, the post analysis, like looking at far fields, looking at currents, looking at near fields, and so on. But you basically only solve one time the fundamental equation. And in all the second analysis, the following analysis are just post analysis from the original one. And for example, a far field can look like this. So here you see the antenna directivity, while as in reality, the individual antenna was pretty smooth. Here you can see that this uh, is a little bit uh, choppy, so to speak. So, and that's because of the uh, that antenna interacts with the system and it basically distorts uh, the pattern. But that distortion can happen on the pattern, but it can also have slightly influence, for example, on the S parameter, uh, SYZ parameter. You can look also at interaction between antenna ports because it might be that that the antenna on the top and on the bottom can slightly interact. Now, in this case, you might not have seen it, it was pretty fast, but it was about minus 60 dB. So that's a pretty sl small interaction. So likely there is not going to be a problem between the antenna coupling at the top uh, and the bottom. So this is showing here an aspect of electronics about uh, antenna integration. Uh, we can also do something on propagation. Uh, as I mentioned, it's also one of the scales. It's a propagation scale. Uh, and there we are uh, working very strongly as a team within uh, within Siemens, within our Siemens EDA colleagues and, and, and myself on the 3D side. So here we have essentially, um, we can look at uh, pro propagation in the context of 5G. Now what is needed for that is the following. If you have, let's say, a 5G wireless system, being it in a factory or being it in, in um, I don't know, in a shopping mall or, or uh, somewhere else, whatever, in a stadium, for example, um, the performance of that system, the communication will be heavily dependent indeed on the 3D cap uh, on, on, on the 3D system itself, because especially if you go to millimeter waves where you have beam forming and so on, it's very important for optimizing your 5G system, that you really do have a very good knowledge of that 3D environment. In case you have that good knowledge of the 3D environment, represented by a 3D model, you can really optimize your 5G system, for example, the location of your antennas, the number of your antennas, and really then also, let's say, reduce the cost and still have a good performance of your 5G communication. So what we do here, we basically, allow here to model, in this case, it's a factory here, a factory, the 3D model of the factory. We are running coverage maps. We are running ray tracing models. We look at multipath. We look at how a signal goes from a transmitter into a receiver by different paths. Okay? And all of that information, that fundamental electromagnetic information, the EM fields, the, uh, the delay spread and so on, is then essentially used to generate IQ data uh, for that uh, at the uh, at the protocol level, which is then relevant, for example, for a 5G analysis. That is all happening uh, here. So here we have an example here. I mean, if suppose that you want to equip a, a factory 
with a 5G installation, you need to have a number of these antennas or radio, radio units put into this factory. Such a factory can be complex. I mean, it can be models of people, of robots and everything, uh, everything like that. Not all of that is important for 5G. So typically, if you have such a model, you typically want to defeature it. You want to remove some of these components that, you, that are not so relevant for the communication because at the end, it might add some complexity that is not really uh, needed for the 5G analysis. And essentially, you want to reduce your complexity to something that is just relevant to capture the main, the main phenomena in your, uh, in your propagation. Clearly, the walls, the floor, the big machines, the rooms, and so on. And with that, you also need to put the material in there. It's important to put that material because the conductive material clearly will behave com different than a, let's say, a dielectric type of uh, material. So you can supply different uh, materials. Uh, we have a lot of material models uh, into our system that you can put onto the different uh, locations of that uh, of that factory. So that's showing uh, over here. We have this little control room there that we can have a concrete or we have we can put it uh, conductive. And the mesh, as you can see, is pretty simple because we are using a ray tracing technology. So this is not method of moments. This is really ray tracing. We can really go to to these, uh, let's say, small tessellated uh, surfaces. And a, we can also put an antenna there. In this case, it's it's just a dipole type of uh, uh, antenna. Or again, if you want, if you have other types of antennas like array antennas, which is important for 5G, we can also construct that and integrate that into the factory. So we have here this array 28 gigahertz here that we put at that location, which of course clearly will behave differently as the uh, dipole antenna. Such an antenna was generated up front. We generate a synthetic model. And then we integrate that synthetic model into the full factory to look at uh, to look at the coverage. Okay, so we have you can look at an incident uh, model as shown here. Incidence is just you take the antenna and you check if there is no diffraction, no reflection. What is the field? What is the coverage? And then in a second calculation, you can really look at the total field, which is a combination of direct rays reflections, diffractions with different uh, orders. And this is allows you to build up the complexity. In the most simple form, you might just have a direct ray or a reflection, and then you can build up complexity by, for example, adding diffraction. So the field you see here is a direct field. This is the coverage inside that, uh, that uh, factory. Um, and this is here the uh, field where we have diffraction and reflection taken into account. And here you see the shadow zones behind, for example, the pillars there or behind this uh, this control room. And clearly, there you will have a much lower, a much lower uh, uh, reception, uh, much lower uh, coverage. Okay. And that data essentially uh, is is interesting clearly to to uh, design your uh, let's say your network, your uh, of communication network. So you can look at also specifically the rays, the direct rays, the reflections, the diffractions, and so on, uh, and optimize your 5G installation. Pass on to my final part, just a few slides on EMC. Um, EMC is a big requirement clearly for, elect for electronic systems because there is interferences, there can be compatibility problems. There's a lot of regulations to that as well. So a simulation can really help to address your EMC problems at device level. Testing is typically expensive, time consuming, doesn't create a lot of insight. Of course, it's needed at the end. There will still be some testing needed. But really to, to design and, and to really address EMC problems early on, you will need to do simulation. It's much cheaper, can be pretty fast. The number of variants is uh, clearly, I mean, you can you can automatically uh, automatically do that. And in our simulation environment, Sim Center, we have that capability to do EMC analysis uh, pure based on uh, simulation. I do want to add here that uh, we have we have of course the level of the board and the package, which is then mostly in the expedition hyperlink side. 
So that's not really sim center. That is really the pure board side. We have that as well. But if you're talking about device level of EMC and also look at a virtual simulation of normatives qualification, this is where sim center 3D fits into. So we can do EMC analysis on the devices with multiple boards or qualifications for, uh, for normatives. And that is typically a standard uh, EMC. How does it look like? For example, here we have a case where we have a computer rack, which has inside some PCBs, some, uh, some components, some conducting components, some dielectric components. We have an outside um, uh, disturbance signal, an antenna shown here at the left and the right side. And basically, these will generate signals that go into that device, and that actually could couple with some of the uh, with some some other ports inside. And the question is, can we calculate that coupling? How much, basically, of that energy from outside is going to get inside into the device and coupling with one of these uh, with one of these ports over there? Again, this is a boundary element technique, so we only need to model the surface. You see, it's really taking the sheet. Um, the, the uh, basically the sheet of that that uh, system, and only model uh, model discretize uh, the surface. We set up an I would say a full wave analysis. It's not a very big system, so you can do a full wave analysis here, and from the results you can then look. And this is now the final few seconds before we close here the the, the call. And what's happening here? You see there is this red spot in the middle, and this is the coupling from the outside antenna to a particular device at the inside. And that's actually was the reason to do that EMC because we did not want to see this coupling. But because of, uh, of, of, the, of the interactions, we did notice that, that, uh, that particular coupling. And it's what we wanted to test and we can, uh, we can do it. It's also a pretty fast calculation. It's not a very big model, but reasonably accurate and, and gives some very good insight on why this coupling was, uh, was occurring. And with this, I would like to uh, finish my, uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening.